So thank you, yes, last talk of today of the conference. I hope you had a good time, right? I know I'm the only thing between now and sort of the food and the drinks. So um, I'll try to keep it light and fun. I think t today we had a lot of great and wonderful talks. Um, and they were a little bit technical, I want to say, right? And so I just want to give a disclaimer that my talk won't be very technical. So um, uh, bear with me if, if those were your expectations. I know I work at Microsoft, so maybe <laughs> that sort of gave the expectations, but um, it will be a little bit more focused on design. And so I'll talk about, yeah, as the title says it, right? Trending tools and methodologies for user experience, because in the end, I'm an experienced designer at heart. And so, um, why use, use tools and methodologies, right? So I really like using tools and methodologies. Also within Microsoft, we're a big fan of it. I also brought a few of the toolkits with me um, that I'll talk about uh, today. Um, but basically, why we love it is because you can make things visual. Um, I always like to say, or it's a quote actually I heard from someone else who said it and I liked it, that if there's one language that we all understand, it's a visual language. And so making things visual helps. Uh, it helps to align on things, uh, communicate. And that also allows us to co-create, right? So as a designer, um, I know like sometimes there are a lot of people who work in the space of design. And so I always like to collaborate and co-create because I really believe that leads to the best results. And then guidance and structure. So providing sort of a process that allows you to, to see the steps and um, yeah, basically what the, what the structure can be. Um, and then I know we're here right at a conference for UI lovers. Um, and I, I'm not a front-end developer. I'm really a, more of a researcher and a designer. So I put this in because I thought, yeah, why should this be interesting for me? Because I know like as designers, sometimes people hate us, the, the, especially developers don't like us because we're like all playing with our design and fluffing it up as the Deborah said as well, right? And we're making your life sometimes really, really hard <laughs> because all of a sudden, I think uh, Deborah mentioned it, right? Sometimes we can make all these changes and then uh, we create a lot of rework or a lot of work in general. Um, so I just wanted to say I, what I hope with this, with what I'm presenting today, is that it can give you some insights in how we think, right, as designers and what comes in the process, sort of, and what we do in order to design what we design. Um, and maybe it's not directly useful, but then at least it gives a bit of an understanding of how I think our thought process works. And maybe there are some things that can still inspire uh, for the process or for the company you work at to share it with the design teams. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say hi as well. So my name is Josephine uh, Schultes. Um, uh, since Monday, my title is that I'm creative product uh, manager. So, um, but I always like to brand myself as a design strategist because I think titles are titles, so who cares maybe. Um, <laughs> this was me in front of a Microsoft office, very happy, this is actually when I just started. Uh, I'm still very happy in my role though, it doesn't mean that, <laughs> that I'm not happy anymore. But, uh, but, and so this is me in, the, in Seattle also with the HoloLens, so actually in my team we have a big part that focuses on uh, creating HoloLens solutions as well. With Metaverse, of course, that's a big thing now. So um, it's more and more, more and more customers are basically asking for it. Um, and so what I do is always a bit interesting because um, when I say I'm a designer at Microsoft, a lot of people think, oh, you work in the product groups, um, which is a possibility. But actually, I'm more on the, on the yeah, uh, customized or consulting side of it. And so what I do is that I customize tech for, for customers um, and so other companies and mostly tech that focuses on conversational AI, digital twins uh, or mixed reality. So the technologies where the interface becomes super complex and a user experience all of a sudden isn't that easy or standard anymore. And so in that case, we need to do a lot of research, right? And also sort of get a clearer understanding of what would be the requirements to determine what we're in the end actually going to build. Uh, my team is global, uh, which is interesting because it means I work with a lot of different cultures. And also when I travel to customers, they can be in any country. So I had uh, customers in Europe, but also in the Americas. Uh, so I was in Texas, for example, which is super different from uh, when I traveled to Qatar or to Botswana. So there are really a lot of different cultures, and that's also funny because design can be very different in those countries. So what people find nice design is really different. Um, 
I mean, sometimes I had customers who really wanted like the rainbow word art as a title in an app. I mean, that's the, this was two years ago, so this <laughs> that's their definition. Um, and I work across industry, so uh, that makes it fun because I get to see a lot. But besides my work at Microsoft, I also host a, a podcast, which is called the Design Strategy Podcast. And I started this more as a fun project on the side, just to talk to people outside of Microsoft, right, and get a bit of a feeling of, okay, what's happening in the industry? What are designers talking about? What does design look like at other companies? And what are their insights and learnings from uh, over the years? And now you may wonder, like, okay, when I talk about design strategy, what do I mean, right? So I always like this spaghetti image um, of the, we, we always call this sort of the fuzzy front end. So basically, when we, whenever we start a project as a designer, you always have this process of, oh, we want to do something with technology, for example. In my work at Microsoft, that's often the question where it starts with. So they say, okay, we want to do something with AI. We heard it's a new thing, right? Like, can, can we do something with it? Um, and in that case, we basically go through this process of, of, of searching, selection, implementation, and capturing value. So basically starting with a problem definition, doing research, understanding the requirements, functional and non-functional, and from there basically going through iterations to get like a clear design brief. And so today we spoke a lot about actually building it, right, But and, and actually designing it. But a lot of the things I'll talk about today are a little bit about the process before that. So basically, how do you determine what to build? Um, just to show a bit the other side of the, of the process. Um, and so what I always like to ask in my podcast, one question is, what trends do you see in this field, right? So what is happening right now? What are the things that you think should really be, uh, oh yeah, my microphone is better now, that, um, uh, that everybody should know of? And so that basically resulted in the topics that I want to discuss today. So I have four trending sort of topics that, are, that a lot of people are talking about in the design industry. Um, the first one being humanity-centered design. So looking at societies instead of individuals. Um, inclusive design, so you may have heard about that, right? So inclusive design, it's different from accessible design, but basically looking, it's related to accessibility uh, by solving for one and extending to many. Uh, Need-based personas, which is sort of a new twist, or I think a more specific twist on creating personas and categorizing sort of based on shared need needs. And then um, unintended consequences. So how do we foresee um, yeah, the, the consequences that can happen when we create a design? Which sounds a bit fake, but I'll get to it. Um, and what I'll uh, tell about for each of those is basically why did it inspire me? Um, what is it about, and how could you apply or implement it? I heard someone in the back. <laughs> they don't like this talk. I was like, oh, okay. So, <laughs> okay, so humanity-centered design, right? So this may sound a bit fake, but I really wanted to share this because I think it's interesting that in the space of design, we always spoke about human-centered design, right? We always said, okay, with it, as designers, we're looking at an individual and we're designing a user experience for them, for the user. And so basically, humanity-centered design is this new sort of trend in which we're saying, okay, we shouldn't look at one individual, but we should actually look at the system. And this becomes especially important when we start looking at more complex problems, like, for example, plastic pollution, uh, sustainability in general right now, right, the environment. Um, and so that's why this is getting more and more attention. And the guy who actually told about this is Gustavo Zepeda. And so he basically said, okay, stepping away from the traditional human-centered design, right, to solve wicked problems, as we call them, so those really big, complex problems. Um, uh, and yeah, basically look into that. And fun fact is that he's currently actually working at IKEA, so I thought that was also nice because he really went down that road of sort of designing, um, uh, yeah, really for, for bigger context, as IKEA is also looking into that more and more. And so the official definition of humanity-centered design is a practice where designers focus on people's needs, not as individuals, but as societies, with complex, deep-rooted problems. So whereas human-centered design puts a face to a user, humanity-centered design, expands it basically to a societal uh, level of world populations and 
bigger sort of context. And this sounds all very nice, but to give a very sort of simple example of the principles. So basically what they're saying, the four principles of humanity-centered design are adopting a people-centered approach, so looking at people in general, making sure to solve the right problem, which sounds very standard and like, duh, but this really is a thing that often isn't really done. Um, everything is a system, so everything is linked, and I'll explain it a bit more with the example. And doing small interventions instead of sort of, yeah, doing it all in one time. I mean, it's also logic because we work a lot in, uh, in an agile way, right? But still, I think smaller interventions is sometimes easier said than done. And so one example for which they use humanity-centered design is, for example, the plastic pollution in Ghana. And so for Ghana, what they actually said, like, of course you could blame, uh, you could blame or you could say, okay, this is a problem, right? Plastic solution, and it is because uh, John Doe is throwing the plastic uh, over here on a pile. But is John Doe really the, the sort of user in this case? Is he experiencing this problem? Or are it the people that are living in the villages around the pollution? Uh, the government also is related to this, right? Because why aren't they taking care of this? Why aren't they providing solutions for it? Uh, what about the uh, production companies producing the food and the drinks? They also have a foot in this. So it's this whole ecosystem that you're basically creating. And so what humanity-centered design says, like, immerse yourself among the citizens, right? So do, like, more thorough research. Uncover root causes. So try to do the exercise of, like, why, why, why? And this is, of course, a lot of research-related content, but just wanted to share. Um, and do a system analysis to really understand what are the root causes of the problem and what are the knock-on effects and see what works and brings you closer to a sustainable solution. So something that really solves the problem instead of on the short term, but really on the long term. And so one of the things that often is popular to do and it, are these system maps, right? So this is actually a system map for uh, the pollution in Ghana to basically, instead of having one persona, uh, you're creating a sort of system map or almost a map of, of how all the stakeholders are interconnected and how they are involved in this problem and how you can then design for it. And then I, I know the sort of this is something I wanted to add because it's something we work with a lot, so like a problem statement canvas. I know this is also more focused on research, but I just wanted to share it because often when we design, I think, at least from my experience, uh, the first thing that we always need to make sure is that we're solving the right problem, right? Before we start solving for that problem and we start building something. And I think out of 99% or 9 out of 10, I see that when we are already in the design phase, we discover that the problem actually isn't the real problem. For example, when we do prototype testing. And then you could say, that's oh, that's way too late. Like, how could that happen? But that is often because people don't really see the value of research before starting design, right? And so that's why I wanted to highlight this, because this is always a very easy canvas that you can complete to sort of get that uh, discussion going with customers and with stakeholders within your organization to say, okay, are you really certain that this is a problem though? And aren't we sort of, how do you say that, like, um, uh, invest it, are, are we investing our money right, basically? Um, and aren't we running into any risks of having to do rework later on? Okay, then need-based personas. So this is one, uh, you probably all have heard about personas, right? And this is a little bit of a different twist or a new twist uh, on this. So these are Joris and uh, Emma, and they're from a service design studio. And they basically work with these need-based personas um, because, yeah, they said personas are one of the most famous design thinking tools, right? Everybody uses them. But with that comes that they can be used ineffectively, for example, based on demographics. And that's something that we see as designers happening a lot. And so that's why we more and more designers are talking about need-based personas. Because the one thing we want to prevent is this, right? So if you look at, if you categorize personas based on demographics, Prince Charles and Ozzy Osbourne would be the same persona. Right, okay, <laughs> we all know that that's not correct, right? So this is something we want to prevent. Um, and so what need-based personas do is that they allow you to go beyond those demographics, like age and gender, and focus on like the actual product needs, right? And it makes it easier when designing the new situation and prevents also these unconscious biases. 
And so there's actually a model behind this. Like uh, psychologists did a, did a research and they created this morphological tension model in which they basically said, okay, everybody who's using products is doing that because of uh, these certain sort of behavioral drivers that create a tension. And I'll just show it here. So basically what they say is that there are six motivations, acquisition versus transformation. So the human need for continuity and safety versus change, right? You can understand that's quite opposite. Then impact versus structure. So the individual intent and personal preferences versus sort of rules and rigidness. Um, and then ambition versus competence. So individual limits and limitations versus sort of a need for achievement. And so what we do within Microsoft, for example, is that often when we create personas and we do research, we try to map all the research insights onto these sort of uh, matrices and axes to categorize them based on these tensions. So you get these sort of clusters that form your need-based personas. Um, and so we got this idea actually from Joris and Emma, right? And so this is an example of one of the personas we created uh, last summer, actually, uh, where we had sort of the, we did a research for the new uh, age of, of work, so modern work. And basically we did research into, okay, what are the new people or new workers, what do they want, right? Because you have people now that want to work from home, you have people that, preferred to work uh, a few days at the office uh, or still f uh, like full time at the office. And so these are two examples of, for example, a home buddy, right? So prefers working from home, but their leadership requires them to be at the office a few days per week. Maybe you recognize this, like <laughs> can imagine it's more and more a thing. And then the collaborator preferring to work from home when they need to focus versus really going to the office only for collaboration and sort of being together. And so I think this is nice because it shows sort of the two personas, but instead of saying Jane, Jane Doe and Jane Doe, basically the names and the age and everything and the demographics, we try to name them already on the key needs, which makes it easier for us when we communicate this, for example, to our dev teams and to also with our product management and designers, that everybody is pretty clear on, okay, why are we designing what we are designing? And what we actually also uh, did is that for this template, we added how might we statements. And so, again, this may, may sound like something very uh, research-ish or design-ish, but actually why we did this is because within Microsoft, for example, we often see a big gap between determining what we are designing and setting up the requirements and then actually sort of implementing it. Because if we're only talking about it, we often get miscommunication and we misunderstand things. And so these how might we statements then sometimes make it easier for us to sort of implement and make that next step towards, okay, solutions basically. So saying this is a problem and this is how we can solve it. Um, so basically bridging the gap between research and design, but I think for us sometimes this is also research and dev, right? Because we don't always have designers in between. Sometimes our front end developers are directly the designers depending on the complexity as well of the interface. And so what you could, for example, say with that modern work research is that uh, a user could say, okay, I find it difficult to find meeting rooms that fit my activity. For example, a meeting, a workshop, or a presentation, right? So that's a problem that they have. And then you could rephrase it into a how might we uh, sentence to say, okay, how might we then customize an office space based on the activity taking place? So that already rephrases that research insight into something more concrete so everybody that still needs to work with that data understands, okay, this is then what we need to design. Um, and this is what we need to implement. And so how might we statements, you probably heard of it because it's a popular map method, but it's not often combined with personas. And so we actually really wanted to do this to bridge that gap between research and implementation. Um, and then another thing which we also like to use for that is these interaction flow um, maps. Um, and we actually use this within Microsoft quite a lot, is that if we have a sort of user journey, right, or user scenario, we like to map for that journey already the wireframes, so like low fidelity wireframes, and how that then translates to actions and how other stakeholders than the user may interact with that. So basically, for example, if you would have the goals here of the journey in the top right, you could have all these wireframes in the middle, and then the interconnected relations of all the other stakeholders interacting with that end solution, directly or indirectly. So basically you get one map 
of how we would go from research to design and really to implementing it and how the entire interface would work. And so this tool helps us a lot in, again, collaborating together, co-creating together, and really getting an aligned view of what it is that we're building. And then the third one is inclusive design, right? So uh, we had quite a lot of talks about accessibility. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited as well to see that because within Microsoft, we also really see that as a big thing. And, and one of the topics I also wanted to address is inclusive design. So actually, uh, this looks a bit weird because it's my podcast and now I <laughs> interviewed myself for the podcast, but I got a lot of requests of people that were like, oh, but Josephy, what do you actually do? So then at a certain point, <laughs> I also interviewed one of my uh, teammates to sort of talk together about what we do at Microsoft. Um, and so Alina, same as me, is a really big fan of, um, of inclusive design, right? And looking more and more at accessibility. And so what we really like about inclusive design is that it doesn't look at disability as a personal health condition, but a mismatched human interaction. So basically we're saying you haven't designed the product right, right? There's, there's not a good user experience. And so why we also like inclusive design is because it's different from accessible design, because it really becomes an integrated part of the process. We're not saying, okay, we're designing a separate product for someone who has a disability, but we're saying, okay, your core product, the user experience isn't right, and we should sort of redesign it from the start and make sure that in our process, we always sort of include this way of thinking. Um, and so inclusive design really looks at the diversity of experience that may exclude a person from uh, using an interface effectively, to say it in really nice words. Um, and so it's closely related to accessibility, but rather than an outcome, it's a methodology for how to approach design, basically, and so the way of thinking. Um, it's a process for creating a design that can be used by a diverse group of people. And so in the digital realm, of course, as you all know, the process of inclusive design starts by identifying situations, right, where people are excluded. And so recognizing that exclusion can happen to anyone depending on particular circumstances. And that's really the core of some of these inclusive design methodologies. And with Microsoft, we've also created a methodology that really looks at that part. So basically saying, okay, disability happens because of circumstances and everybody can experience a disability or mismatch as we like to call it. Um, but before I get to our toolkit, I also wanted to point out other toolkits, right? So Adobe has created a big sort of resource on inclusive design. There's actually also some, uh, a lot of UI resources in there, whereas our methodology focuses more on the process. So this is one I really wanted to highlight. Um, then also this tool from IDEAN and Cards for Humanity is also a fun one to sort of explore and uh, basically fa check and review if your design is accessible. So it's almost like a role-playing game, like, okay, how can you meet their needs, right? And you deal basically a pair in the middle, and then you get, okay, Aston Wall is very caring and is deaf. And then basically the idea is that through sort of uh, imagining and putting yourself in their shoes, you test and review your product. So this is sort of a fun way to, to have that uh, process and do those reviews. Um, and then the Microsoft uh, uh, methodology basically has these persona spectrums that we like to think of. And so you, you may have seen these. Um, uh, they were created by Kat Holmes uh, already some time ago, but so basically this spectrum helps us to understand related mismatches and motivations across a spectrum of permanent, temporary, and situational scenarios. And so basically what we mean with this is that um, someone can have a permanent disability of, for example, being blind, right, if we look at seeing specifically, but if I had eye surgery, or I have something in my eye, like in general, or I may be distracted, and I'm looking somewhere else, that, those are also ways of sort of a disability, but it's more uh, temporary and situational. So temporary because it's a certain period of time that I won't be able to see, or situational because I'm in a situation that's being caused by my environment or my context. So for example, another really good example of a situational Disability is when the sun is uh, hitting my laptop screen and through, due to the reflection, I can't see the content of, of my laptop. And so I think this is a very interesting way to think about disabilities and also about users using uh, your interfaces, right? And so one of the things that I did uh, for this toolkit is to make it a bit more implementable and basically also do it together with your teams 
is to use very simple design thinking tools, such as an empathy map, in which instead of in the middle you put the persona, you put the spectrum, right? So you say, okay, we look at the activity seeing, um, and for seeing, try to envision how someone with a permanent, temporary, or situational uh, position on the spectrum, what would they do, what would they say, what would they think, and what do they feel? And we actually did these workshops with people who were really on the spectrum, so they could really tell us about, okay, this is what I do, this is what I feel, and this is also an exercise we continuously do in our product groups. Um, then you could map a user journey, right, and map mismatches based on a physical context, the social context, uh, the human environment, so for example, the sun hitting the screen of my laptop, uh, or objects maybe, I don't know, maybe there's a lamp hanging on the height of my hat and I'm bumping into it, right? Those kind of things uh, can cause that. Um, and then ideation, so what if you then have a mismatch where a, a product isn't usable, right? How can you then come up with, an, uh, with a solution for it? So again, using the how might we statements and basically making it a little bit easier to, to start going from a problem to a solution. And then the last point I wanted to show out were unintended consequences. And so this is, I think, getting more and more important as it also is related to ethics. Um, and so who I spoke about, uh, about this topic on the podcast is uh, Susie or Susanna. And she worked back then at MIT uh, GovLab. Uh, today, she actually is a researcher for Meta. So she looks at Facebook integrity. Um, and so what she said, her point was that designers can play a big role in preventing these unintended consequences. Also, when looking at, for example, ethics of AI. And so unintended consequences is a term that was created by sociologist uh, Robert K. Merton. And so it refers to outcomes that are not the ones foreseen and, unintend and intended by a purposeful action. So basically saying, I'm designing a product for a user so they can do A, but actually they started doing B, C, D, E, right? And you see this a lot right now with social media. And so uh, actually a, a professor of a university where I studied in Delft, acknowledges that designers are very well trained to, to iterate about these consequences, right, and think about this, but they may lack good training in sort of the implementation of the proposals and really taking the time to think about this. And so one of the um, uh, methodologies that we actually use within our product groups uh, and also within our ethics AI uh, team is the futures cone. And so the futures cone basically looks at the possible, the plausible, the probable, and the preferred, to say it like that. It's a good exercise for speaking, <laughs> um, especially tonight after <laughs> a few drinks. So um, basically what it is is that it's just a brainstorming exercise, right? But instead of only thinking about, okay, what is the need that a user would, need, would, would use my interface for today, you start thinking about, okay, what's the weirdest thing that can happen with my interface? Like, if you think about testing it, like what could go wrong in the worst possible way? Um, and so basically you ideate first about, okay, probably this will happen, right? Based on the current trends that we're seeing. But then, and preferably we want them, uh, we want them to use it in a certain way. Uh, possible is the future knowledge, so it might happen. And then the plausible, the current knowledge could happen. And the wild card is basically low probability, but high impact. Um, so that's the one that you maybe don't really want, but if it happens to say it like that, shit really hits the fan, right? So, um, and the funny thing is that actually when I studied in uh, Sweden for a while, we had this exercise and we had to do it, and first I was like, oh, this sounds super fake, like why should I ever do this as if I could ever come up with something that could really happen in 30 years, right? But so we did it, and so what we came up with is that you, in the future, you could sue people if they would cough on you, in the metro, for example, because they could get you sick. And so we thought, based on that, it may happen that people will wear masks in the future to protect themselves. And so, yeah, this sounds like COVID, right? So a lot of this actually happened then with COVID. And so, to me, that sort of proves, now that I look back at it, that you can actually get quite close to actual sort of future scenarios with this future cone. So it's a very interesting toolkit, and yeah, we use it within Microsoft as well. Um, we also have these guidelines, oh, sorry, guidelines for human-AI interaction. 
Um, so these are basically cards that are based on some of the AI guidelines we've published in a paper already some time ago. And so based on that, we created some patterns for interface design and how you sh can make sure to your users that it's clear that there's an AI in the interface or embedded in the interface. Because AI is mostly based on predictions, right? If you say it very simply. But how do you make it clear to your users that everything that's happening in an interface is happening because of predictions and it's not per se, um, I don't know, because they are doing a certain action, but it's based on data that maybe the user doesn't know that the system is using. So this is basically a, yeah, guidelines, guidelines on how can you make it more clear and transparent that there's AI embedded in your system and that a user is therefore yeah, seeing certain things in the interface. Another one is a judgment call. So judgment call, um, and I have, by the way, the previous one and this one, I also have them with me right now. So if you want to have a closer look at them, feel free to, to drop by and then I can give them. Um, and so judgment call is a card game in which basically if you have your product or your interface, everybody takes a role. So for example, a hacker or a child or a grandma. And so in these roles, you start judging the product. So you start reviewing the product, and you start writing product reviews for it. And so this is also, again, a toolkit developed by our product groups and our ethics groups to make it easier for you to put yourself in the shoes of others and really have a critical look at your interface and what could be the, the unintended consequences, right? What, what could happen or how could people look at your product in ways that maybe you don't want them to look at it? And so, yeah, with that, we're actually already at the summary. So I didn't take a full hour like, as planned, but probably you're happy with that because you're also ready for some rings. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to highlight, right, humanity-centered design, inclusive design, need-based personas and unintended consequences. Again, uh, we had a lot of talk today about how, how do we build, right? How, how, do we, how do we build interfaces? And this looks a little bit more into the process before that. So basically, why are we building what we're building and how do we get there? And again, hopefully this uh, inspired you in some way, maybe not directly, but otherwise maybe uh, your teams internally can use it and um, uh, you can use it as well to align and communicate. Um, and so with that, I would like to say thank you very much. Um, and yeah, let's connect on LinkedIn. I always like that. And then let's talk tonight. <laughs>